I am really excited to introduce this speaker as you guys come in. So Kara Hoppy has been here, gosh, two, more than two years. Yeah. So she is um, a Wisconsin native, which is always one of my favorite things to announce. She grew up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and um, just crossed the river to Winona State to do her undergraduate, did her DO in a combination of Kansas City uh, as well as in Illinois, and then was in Seattle both for her OBGYN residency and her MFM fellowship. We were very fortunate to recruit her here almost two years ago. And she has certainly made great strides in um, expanding the blueprint of clinical research in the MFM department. I know most of you are familiar with her work in postpartum hypertension um, and home management of and uh, assessments of blood pressure. Um, so she is going to talk to us today about that very topic. Um, and I ask for your attention. We'll do questions at the end. Um, Katie Anthony will be kind enough to moderate. trying out this new mic. So the objectives of this talk today are after participation in this series, participants will develop a better understanding of new research, technology, and evidence-based guidelines, increase ability to use newly acquired knowledge to improve obstetrics and gynecology care regarding specifically postpartum hypertension. A little overview of what I hope to cover today is a, a history of hypertension disorders of pregnancy, um, a background of postpartum hypertension, um, defining hypertension disorders of pregnancy, physiologic changes that affect blood pressure in pregnancy and specifically postpartum, postpartum management and treatment of hypertension, a little bit about hospital readmission and long-term outcomes and interventions for people who have hypertension disorder of pregnancy. So to start with a history of hypertension disorders of pregnancy, I thought this was a little fun. Um, the late 5th and early 4th century BC, the Hippocratics subscribed to the theory of the four humors to describe illness and disease. They considered women as wet and men, in, men were dry. Um, and because a woman's flesh was porous and soft, she was at risk of drawing in too much moisture, resulting in an overabundance of fluids or humor and subsequent illness. Uh, in 2000 BC, um, the Egyptians um, had a, uh, a document that um, talked about the wandering womb, and as it wandered, women became sick, and it was one of the first references to eclampsia. And in 400 BC, um, Hippocrates stated, a headache accompanied by heaviness and convulsions during pregnancy is considered bad. Um, Fallopius actually is, is credited with um, discovering the uh, ovaries and fallopian tubes, but also um, indicating that the placenta was something only found in the uterus during pregnancy. So we all know the placenta is important with preeclampsia. So medical pioneers moving forward. In 1618, eclampsia first appeared in the Verandas Treatise on Gynecology. And in 1739, um, Bossier de Sauvages uh, differentiated seizures of eclampsia from epilepsy. In 1840, Pierre Rare discovered that there was protein in the urine. And in 1843, John Lever demonstrated that proteinuria was a specific entity to preeclampsia not another kidney ailment, and titled it toxemia. In the mid-1800s, um, hallmark prodromal symptoms of preeclampsia were recognized. In 1872, a survey found 25% of maternal deaths were due to eclampsia, and doctors began to induce labor to cure preeclampsia. And in 1896, um, I don't know how to say this name, but Scipione Rivia Ropi's mercury manometer for blood pressure management uh, led to recognition that preeclampsia was actually uh, related to a hypertensive disorder. So regarding a timeline of diagnosis and treatment, um, in the Middle Ages, from 1800s, from the Middle Ages to the 1800s, really bloodletting and opiates um, were the staple um, to prevention and treatment of preeclampsia. And actually, the amount and frequency of bloodletting depended on the strength of the patient's symptoms and severity, um, bleeding from the arm was attempted initially. However, there are reports, if convulsions continued, that bleeding would be repeated. And in some cases, the jugular vein or temporal artery were opened in an attempt to stop the convulsions. Um, it was then um, more kind of transition to this aggressive concept of delivering patients. 
um, to cure eclampsia to more of a, con a conservative environment. And so in the 1900s, Horn was the first to use magnesium sulfate to prevent eclampsia. So the focus was more on stopping the convulsions and letting people you know, deliver when they were going to deliver. Um, there has been uh, randomized trials, but really starting in 1990s, that demonstrated superiority of magnesium sulfate over other anticonvulsants to prevent eclampsia. But there's really been no changes to prenatal care or diagnosis of preeclampsia since the 60s. And then in 2013, the classification of hypertension and pregnancy was updated by ACOG. This is um, from Jeff Gordon, actually, and he um, gave me this um, kind of funny paper that was reported as a case report in uh, July of 1825 in the New England. Um, a case of peripheral convulsions occasioned by undigested food, actually. So she had been taken in for convulsions. She had severe pain and headache and sensation, um, though there were there was a load at the stomach. She had just commenced her ninth month of pregnancy. And they go on to say, I immediately took two pounds of blood from her arm. Um, she had eaten green apples that were not fully grown, and she had eaten about two dozen the day before. And so they were you know, saying that this was related to these green apples. Uh, so they were induced to give her an emetic. And so then in consultation, um, they did venesection, laudatum, tincture of castor, and valerian. Um, and then the morning of the 12th, it says, um, that you know he did this vaginal exam, which he frequently did, and the head was there ready to deliver. But you know I think we've made some advancements since that. But it, this is a big journal and a, kind of a funny paper. But you know really the history of of these hypertension-related disorders was um, was thought of in an interesting fashion for many years. So to move forward quite a bit um, regarding the background of kind of current. Uh, hypertension-related disorders. Almost 10% of pregnancies are actually affected by hypertension-related disorders in the U.S. Um, a recent um, reference from uh, Periodata say that 22% of pregnancies in Wisconsin are actually affected by hypertension disorders. Um, postpartum readmission has increased in the United States, and postpartum hypertension is actually one of the leading indications for hospital readmission, as well as maternal death in the United States. And it's further a problem uh, in developing countries. The exact incidence of postpartum hypertension is difficult to ascertain, according to a reference by Sabai, um, that uh, despite these limitations, the estimate de novo postpartum hypertension um, of preeclampsia ranges from 0.3 to 27%. So why should we care about postpartum hypertension? There's been a real move uh, in the national focus on hypertension and pregnancy. Um, uh, kind of started with the 2013 Executive Summary uh, Hypertension Report. Um, the Council on Patient Safety and Women's Health Care has put a lot of money, as well as the Alliance for Innovation and Maternal Health, really looking at um, preventing severe complications of maternal death um, with a focus um, in the postpartum period as well. The California Collaborative is a, a real leader in quality improvement and uh, interested in hypertension efforts. And uh, in 2015, uh, one of the first um, Initiatives by WPC and WISPIC was actually a hypertension initiative. And that's around the time that I started. And so I um, was like, this is a great opportunity to further you know, investigate something I'm really interested in. Um, and participated in um, a task force here regarding postpartum hypertension and looking at decreasing readmissions. Um, and I'll go through that kind of a, throughout the talk. This is the um, report from 2013 by ACOG, Hypertension, hypertension and Pregnancy. I wanted to just put this up here as a reference if people have questions about you know, definitions of hypertension-related disorders. It's a nice reference to the updated current definitions, which include chronic hypertension, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, chronic hypertension, and superimposed preeclampsia, and then preeclampsia with severe features. And I wasn't going to go through all the, the details of that, but it's a reference if you need it. Looking at Unity Point Health Meritor data, um, again, back from 2015, we had close to 4,000 deliveries, and there were around 500 uh, individuals who had a hypertension-related disorder. That's about 12% of all the deliveries occurring at uh, Unity Point Health Meritor, and it's responsible for 31% of the NICU admissions. Um, regarding specific types of hypertension disorders, it's predominantly gestational or preeclampsia-related disorders, 81%, followed by chronic hypertension, close to 20% of the patients, and eclampsia is really rare. So what do we know about postpartum hypertension? And at this point, um, I'll really you know, transition and focus to that um, period of time in the pregnancy. 
So postpartum hypertension can really be related to the persistence of either gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, uh, pre-existing chronic hypertension, or a de novo secondary um, cause. Um, this is uh, a manuscript um, titled Etiology of Management in Postpartum Hypertension and Preeclampsia, published in AJOG in 2012 by Sabai. Um, many of you may know he's one of the you know, leaders of hypertension and pregnancy and publishes quite a bit on that. It's a nice reference again, and what I want to just focus uh, your attention here is it's a table, etiology and differential diagnosis of postpartum hypertension. And specifically, this red box zone here is something to think of with people who have refractory or hy refractory hypertension or persistent hypertension. Really uncommon reasons why people would have th these issues, but just to keep in the mind, you know, pre-existing renal disease, hyperthyroidism, primary hyperaldosteronism, fetal chromocytoma, and renal artery stenosis. Again, they're rare, but something to think of. Um, so, regarding physiologic changes in pregnancy, here's um, a reference from Creasy, the textbook. Um, and you can see that um, this particular study was done um, looking at um, women throughout their uh, pregnancy. They did serial measurements, um, again, through the pregnancy and, uh, again, four and six weeks postpartum. They found, on average, that blood pressures were lower during pregnancy than in the postpartum. Again, people will start up here um, kind of at their baseline, they'll nadir around 12 to 16 weeks and slowly gradually increase their blood pressures around 28 weeks, achieving probably near their baseline at term. They'll d go down briefly. And then some, this particular um, study found that they actually ended up higher than they did from baseline at pregnancy. Um, but early in the first trimester, that fall is thought to probably be caused by local mediators, process cycling, nitric oxide, and the physiologic blood volume changes. And the reduction primarily affects diastolic blood pressures. This is systolic up here. This is diastolic. And you can see the diastolic is a little bit more affected than the systolics. And I'll further go through specifically the postpartum period um, moving forward here. So Walters, in the 80s, um, first looked at a cohort of around 100 women who were non-hypertensive and actually found that there was a puerperial rise in blood pressures just as a general phenomenon. And so both systolic and diastolics um, rose for about the first four days, um, with an average rise in systolic of six millimeters of mercury and diastolic four millimeters of mercury, and that 12% of women actually exceeded a diastolic blood pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, and then uh, down here below, you'll see some references of uh, further um, interest in specifically people with hypertension or preeclampsia. And uh, there again, there's a decrease in blood pressure within those first 48 hours, but the blood pressure increases between three and, days, six post, three and six days postpartum. Um, there's really two major references about what happens postpartum. Um, again, Walters, um, he looked at 67 women in Australia. These people had to agree to stay in the hospital for a week, so this data just is really about one week postpartum. The mean age of the women was uh, 29, and 35 gave birth prior 37 weeks. Proteinuria was present in 30 of the women. Uh, 22 patients required hypertension treatment prior to delivery, and 10 continued that postnatally. And what he found here was that this data is from day five, and that 50, more than 50% of the women had a systolic blood pressure over 50 and 100. And that, again, that max occurred on day five. Um, they also found that it was not infrequent that people had blood pressures higher than 170 over 100 in those days. And then Tati Mao in 2010 um, wanted to ask the question of, well, how long does this hypertension, if it occurs, actually take to normalize? And so he looked at a retrospective cohort of 62 women with gestational hypertension or preeclampsia between 15 and 40 weeks. And they found that um, if the blood pressure is normalized, the time to normalization was about 5.4 plus or minus 3.7 weeks. But 20% of them were re remaining hypertensive at six months. Um, and three had a diagnosis of secondary hypertension. Going, again, going back to that table where that's a pretty rare diagnosis, but something to think of. So to treat or not to treat. Um, in this next session, I really want to kind of go through the current evidence that we have um, regarding different uh, concepts of uh, treating postpartum hypertension. So what blood pressures warrant treatment? And the current ACOG guidelines are based upon expert opinion rather than experimental data. And they actually recommend treating uh, postpartum hypertension at a systolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 150 or a diastolic 
um, greater than or equal to 150, sorry, 100. I was trying to figure out where that came from. Like, why do we treat blood pressure at that particular va value? Um, this is uh, from a manuscript, um, uh, the manuscript of postpartum hypertension that was published by Tammy and Deceit um, in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2002. And it just took uh, some quotations from that. Um, the observation that most fits are unheralded by warning signs makes postpartum hypertension all the more worrisome. The aim of treatment is to prevent severe hypertension and its sequelae, i.e. cerebral hemorrhage and very occasionally eclampsia. However, in the absence of such data we have to rely on clinical experience, this would suggest that the risks are very low and particularly after the third postpartum day. So antihypertensive drugs should be given if the blood pressure exceeds 150 millimeters of mercury systolic or 100 millimeters of mercury diastolic in the first four days of the puerperum. While it's acknowledged that this is a chosen threshold is arbitrary and maybe somewhat low, it should be remembered that blood pressures might continue to rise further in the days to come. Overtreatment with a view to discharging women who are otherwise well and reviewing them in one to two weeks is preferable to keeping them unnecessarily in the ward. And again, this I think has been perpetuated in the current way we manage hypertension postpartum. Um, again, from the uh, manuscript by Sabai in 2012, um, this is really the only algorithm out there for recommended evaluation and management of women with postpartum hypertension. I know it's small, again, it's a reference that you can have, but what I wanted to point out is if you have persistent postpartum hypertension, you should do a detailed history and physical exam. If they, you know, note if they have any cerebral or GI symptoms, labs and looking for proteinuria. But really if they're having hypertension only, they say stop vasoactive drugs, so anything that could be causing vasoconstriction, specifically NSAIDs, which we'll get to here in a minute. Um, look and see if they respond to treatment, and if they do, well, there's no further treatment required, and if there um, is not a response, we need to look further for secondary causes like arteriosclerosis or adrenal tumors or seek consultation. If you have hypertension plus, um, you know, more systemic symptoms, obviously you need to look up secondary causes for this hypertension. Hypertension with proteinuria, cerebral symptoms or convulsions, we think more preeclampsia, probably should get magnesium sulfate, antihypertensives if they respond no further evaluation, and if um, they don't, maybe uh, further imaging or consultation is required. And then hypertension with recurrent symptoms, neurologic deficits, um, look at brain etiologies or stroke, and then hypertension with more GI or help-like syndromes, again, mag, sulfate, hypertension treatment, supportive care, um, and then rarely if they don't respond, thinking of things like TTP, HUS. So there's a Cochrane review out there uh, published by Laura McGee, who also um, is the author on the CHIPS trial. Um, she had the objective in this Cochrane review uh, to look at assessing the relative benefits and risks of interventions to treating postpartum hypertension, specifically with the arms of prevention and then differently treatment. So with prevention, um, they wanted to assess whether routine postpartum medical therapy was better than placebo or no treatment. And then regarding the treatment side of things, whether one antihypertensive therapy is better than placebo <laughs> or no therapy for mild to moderate hypertension, and then um, one hypertensive agent offers advantages over another for mild to moderate or severe hypertension. And in the prevention side of things, there were four trials, a total of 358 women. They can, in the different trials, they looked at furosemide or Lasix, mifedipine, L-arginine, um, and comparing that to placebo or no therapy. Um, and women with antenatal preeclampsia, the real finding that they concluded was that uh, postnatal furosemide is associated with a strong trend towards reduce of antihypertensive therapy in hospital. And there's actually some current um, randomized trials out there currently looking at using Lasix as part of treating postpartum hypertension to see if they can either avoid using any further antihypertensives or less antihypertensives, but those are still pending. Um, and then on the treatment side of things, for the mild to moderate postpartum hypertension, there's a total of three trials and a total of 189 women within those three trials looking at Timoal, hydralazine, or nifedipine with methyl dopa. And they found that the use of additional antihypertensive therapy did not differ between the groups and that the drugs were overall well tolerated. With regards to severe hypertension, there were only two trials, 120 women total, and looking at IV more acute management of hypertension uh, with um, IV hydralazine or nifedipine sublingually or IV libetalol. There were no maternal death or hypotension, and that the use of additional antihypertensive therapy did not differ between the groups. And the final conclusions are really that there is no reliable data out there to really guide or manage women, management of women who have postpartum hypertension. And any 
hypertensive agent used should be based on a clinician's familiarity with drugs, and that future studies really should include data on postpartum analgesics, severe maternal hypertension, breastfeeding, and hospital length of stay and maternal satisfaction with care. So what's the role for magnesium sulfate postpartum? And actually, a resident recently asked me, would you use magnesium sulfate for somebody who's readmitted for postpartum hypertension? So um, the frequency of eclampsia in women with preeclampsia without severe features is 1.6% without prophylaxis um, versus 0.7% with prophylaxis. And that data um, comes through uh, the MAKEPI trial. 21% uh, of eclamptic seizures are reported to occur postpartum. And approximately 90% of postpartum seizures occur within that first week of delivery. Some would say that if you're outside those first three days, that your risk of an eclamptic seizure is really pretty minimal. Antecedal, antecedent symptoms were similar to those with antepartum and interpartum eclampsia. And the most, most uh, prominent predictor is a headache. So the duration of postpartum magnesium therapy, so it's typically continued for 24 hours postpartum. However, the timing of drug administration has been arbitrary, and there's no high quality data to guide this therapy. Um, there was one randomized trial in 2006 performed by Mercer, um, also the, the person responsible for our PPRA management. And what they did is um, they randomized people either 12 hours or 24 hours, and they found no difference in the rate of eclamptic seizures. And so in some references, you'll uh, actually see that they, re they actually recommend that in women who have preeclampsia without severe features, that, that therapy could actually safely be discontinued by 12 hours. And then um, more recently in the literature, there's been a couple articles published. And this one, it was the largest and probably the best performed study. It was um, a plenary uh, oral um, abstract at SMFM last year, done in Latin America by Ludmere. And they wanted to determine if magnesium sulfate post-delivery reduced the risk of eclampsia postpartum with patients with severe preeclampsia. And they noted that they had at least gotten eight grams of magnesium prior to delivery. So all these people got it before delivery. Um, it was a non-inferior design, and that required 1,113 patients. And their study arms were magnesium for 24 hours postpartum, or they actually didn't do any magnesium for the other arm. They wanted uh, their primary outcome to be development of eclampsia within 24 hours postpartum. And in conclusion, they found that patients who received eight grams of magnesium prior to delivery, um, that not receiving it was not um, not reducing, sorry, receiving it was not reducing um, the preeclampsia, and the p-value was 0.99. And time, the significant findings they had though were time ambulation and lactation were significantly decreased in those who didn't receive magnesium. Um, regarding the hypertension uh, task force uh, document, they say that for women in the postpartum period with new onset hypertension associated with a headache, vision changes, or preeclampsia with severe features, that paternal parenteral administration of magnesium sulfate is suggested with a low quality of evidence. And I think the point uh, to make here is really that um, if people have a headache, that's their highest predictor of having a seizure, and that of anybody who comes with postpartum hypertension reporting a headache, those people. I, I don't think anyone would argue that probably the recommendation stands that they should receive it. So the next um, thing I want to talk to a little bit about is it safe to take antihypertensive medications and breastfeed. Um, there's one systematic review um, by Beardmore. And this is the um, main uh, results table from um, this manuscript. And what I want to point out is there are 42 studies that they identified. Um, that the drug pharmacokinetics is affected by protein binding, acidity, and lipophilicity. Uh, uh, and of these, plasma protein binding is the single most important predictor of transfer um, of meds into the breast milk. So drugs that have a high plasma protein binding are less likely to be transferred into the milk. Basic drugs are more likely to be transferred due to the milk being more acidic than plasma. And drugs with high lipid solubility also tend to be highly concentrated in breast milk. Um, the lower the... Um, molecular rate of drugs, also the higher they'll be transferred. Drug clearance is also affected by many other things on the neonatal side, like their suckling pattern, the composition of the milk, the gestational age they are, the, the length the woman spend um, lactating as the breast milk composition changes, doses of medications. Um, and excretory properties of a drug into the breast milk is, is best presented uh, in the literature and in the research as breast milk to maternal plasma concentrations, or the MP ratio. So that's what this particular table uh, demonstrates, and I'll walk, th walk you through that. Um, but in summary, the medications with the high protein binding, they end up having the lowest milk to plasma ratio, and that's felt to be the best profile suitable for breastfeeding. 
Um, this is a small sample size, but it's the best we have and the best data we, we have uh, regarding use of these medications. And interestingly, ACE inhibitors is what we have the most information on and one of the, the medications we least likely use. So this column here are the ones with the high milk to plasma ratio, and um, that's considered over one, intermediate and low. Low and neg negligible are thought to be, um, you know, great candidates for breastfeeding. Um, I want to point out also labetalol nifedipine. Um, there's only a couple people here, and it actually has a high milk to plasma ratio, and nifedipine um, is one that's thought to be um, favorable. And ACE inhibitors down here actually are in the neg negligible column. So in conclusion, the available data to date indicate that ACE inhibitors, methyl dopa, beta blockers, and high protein, uh, or beta blockers with high protein binding, and some calcium channel blockers all appear to be safe uh, treatments of hypertension in a nursing mother. And just to go back for one second, there are a lot of other beta blockers that they've studied here. A lot of them, you know, with this high milk to plasma ratio, but these ones that, you know, some of us probably haven't even heard of are more favorable and we don't use them. One thing about methyl dopa, it has, um, you know, a favorable profile on the, the lactation side of things, but it's associated with postpartum depression. And so it's not actually something we usually use, but if you ever think about using it, postpartum is probably not the time to use it. Um, this is from the NICE guidelines, and it's just another summary table looking at um, what they say is safe for breastfeeding. Um, these ones have no adverse effects on infants receiving breastfeeding, and here's their list that they provide, and then ones with insufficient evidence um, here. Interestingly, an amlodipine is currently in a randomized trial looking at um, efficacy. So what about NSAIDs? Um, they cause vasoconstriction, sodium and water retention, um, and use of larger frequent doses may aggravate pre-existing hypertension or result in new onset hypertension. Um, they work through the Cox pathway and prostaglandins, and that's why they're great for preventing inflammation, but they also work, again, on the kidneys, maintaining renal blood flow, but they cause sodium and water retention and potentially edema, hyperkalemia, and issues with hypertension, and that's the physiologic reasons why we worry about them. Um, the ACOG task force, um, they, their quote is that healthcare providers are reminded of the contribution of non steroidal anti inflammatory agents to increase blood pressure. It's suggested that these are commonly used postpartum for pain relief and that they may be replaced by other analgesics in women with hypertension if it persists more than one day postpartum. And I think this is a real issue because alternatively, opiates are something that are promoted and used, and we're also learning about this right now about how we use too many of them. And so if we don't have NSAIDs, what do we have? Um, and so uh, in 2017, again at SMFM, because of this statement, um, there was a single center retrospective analysis done about 300 women who had preeclampsia with severe features diagnosed at delivery um, or after delivery. And 240 of them had gotten NSAID therapy. And their primary output endpoint was looking at persistent hypertension. And um, they found it in 70% of people who use the NSAIDs and 72% of them who didn't. And so they had no statistical, statistical difference in that primary outcome. And again, this is a retrospective analysis, which is limited in that sense. It's single center. But I, I do think that there's going to be future trials coming. And it's a big, important question to ask. So to treat or not treat conclusions, there's a lack of understanding regarding the natural course of postpartum hypertension. There is considerable uncertainty regarding the need for antihypertensive treatment postpartum due to the concern that patients may be unnecessarily treated if blood pressure is normalized, and thus the management as well as patient counseling has been unguided by the literature. And during the duration of magnesium sulfate remains debatable. Antihypertensive medications are actually compatible with breastfeeding. And there's little evidence um, that we actually probably should read too many of these holding NSAIDs postpartum. I want to now move a little bit towards hospital readmission. So this was um, published by uh, CLAP in 2016, and this looks at hospital readmissions in the United States. And they specifically look just at California, Florida, and New York, which have a lot of state available data. And you can see that from 04 to 11, we have just been increasing. And the actual average is, is now over 2%, which is seen also countrywide. If you look at their next figure, indications for readmission, as listed as their primary indication associated diagnosis, hypertension number one. 
And then they did a nice um, cumulative percentage of readmission um, for all calls uh, readmissions for the four most common prior primary diagnoses. And actually, um, the hypertension is the green dotted line here, and you can see that it's, they say day three, but you know days three to day six are those days for uh, most common readmission. Um, if anyone's interested in wound, wound infection breakdown, that's the red dotted line. Psychiatric disease is the blue line, which follows the same. And then uterine infection is actually you know, more delayed. So I have some data from 2015 from Unity Point Health Meritor. And our postpartum readmission um, at that point was 2%. And the goal is actually to be closer to 1%. Again, hypertension was 30%, the number one cause for readmission. So I mentioned to you a little bit about 2015, the Maternal Hypertension uh, Initiative uh, through WPC and WISPIC. We, we participated in cohort two. There were two cohorts. Cohort one was um, looking at only uh, four quality measures, and then the second cohort was seven quality measures. Um, they were interested in maternal length of stay, consumer education, NICU admission and transfer, the use of low-dose aspirin, uh, for people who had appropriate maternal risk factors, um, the appropriate medical management of acute hypertension. So um, their goal is for someone having acute hypertension to be treated with uh, in less than 60 minutes. Deep debriefs for severe range hypertension and severe maternal morbidity. And when I participated in this task force, we really looked at um, if we were going to participate in this or not, which we are, and we, we uh, submit data through peri data that's followed, um, and then. Um, what could we do here in our institution to potentially help decrease these readmission rates? Um, in an American Heart Association um, reference, strategies to re reduce avoidable maternal readmissions at discharge would, would include implementing comprehensive discharge planning, educate patient caregiver uh, using feedback techniques uh, regarding blood pressure monitoring for um, hypertensive OB patients, signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, hand hygiene, medications, and then schedule and prepare a, a follow-up appointment. Uh, the duration of hospital stay, again, through the hypertension task force by ACOG. Uh, for women whom gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, or superimposed preeclampsia is diagnosed, it's suggested that blood pressure be monitored in the hospital or the equivalent of outpatient surveillance be performed for at least 72 hours. Postpartum, again, days seven to day 10 after delivery or earlier in women with symptoms. This was something we decided to adopt, adopt here and I think as all of you know, most people are staying here in the hospital three days because of their hypertension. And I encourage you to think of what I've just reviewed and how potentially we may be missing the boat um, on actually preventing readmission by using these strategies. Again, seeing people early is effective, but seeing them by days seven to 10, we're gonna miss that time when their hypertension potentially might be the worst. So how's Wisconsin doing after this WISPIC initiative? They've actually published it, published it publicly available online. And the minimal hospital stay part of it of 72 hours was actually achieved by only 38% of the 10 hospitals participating. And of people who had a vaginal delivery, only 13% were staying that long. Um, so post-discharge, what strategies could we use to reduce, avoid, reduce avoidable maternal readmissions? We can promote self-patient management, conduct patient home visits, or follow up with the patient via the telephone. Um, this is actually from Kathy Kastribis, and it's the more recent um, October 2015 to September 2016 postpartum readmission data, and we're at 0.7%. The number of cases is a lot less. And when I when I said to her, I said, this is great. I said, you know, like, what can I tell them about this? What, what have we done to change things? And she said it's hard because of how coding happens, um, where we cut this data in point of time, to actually say what it exactly is about. But Hypertension is not 14%. So whether it's just keeping people in the hospital longer, maybe we're doing better at seeing them early, but it looks like we've effectively done something about reducing our readmission rates. And more interestingly, delivery complications is now at 48%. And this just demonstrates this decrease. We were up, up here near 2%, and now we're below what they wanted at 1% at 0.7%. Can we do better? So I, I set off to try to figure out, you know, how could we continue to improve this postpartum hypertension effort and, and reduce readmissions. So remote patient monitoring for postpartum hypertension is a project that I'm currently working on, and I just wanted to show you a little bit about the equipment and just some very relief, brief preliminary information. This is the tablet that we use for them. 
Um, this equipment, they get a, a cuff, an oxygen sensor, a heart rate monitor, and a scale. These are all Bluetooth. They um, connect to this monitor. It walks them through taking your vitals, how to do them. It asks them some questions about symptoms they might be having at home. And then all this is remoted to the nurse. We have two nurses, Chris and Nicole, who are great. And they have um, something called Livestream. So they have a computer platform where all this data goes in. It gets color coded. They get prompted about somebody having um, urgent or severe hypertension or reported symptoms that are concerning. And then they have a video visit um, that's supposed to be scheduled two days and seven days from discharge, all while the patient is in her house with equipment that avoids them from having to come back to clinic, but also they're taking responsibility for themselves. They're watching their blood pressures. And then we're able to actually treat them outpatient as long as they're not having severe symptoms or, or other issues. Um, we put together algorithms that guide the nurses about levels of, of blood pressure and when you treat and what you treat. And then at some point when their blood pressure is normalized, how you can take them off their medications. Um, so the objective of this program really is to assess a novel approach to outpatient maternal postpartum hypertension surveillance and treatment in those first six weeks postpartum with the ultimate goal to improve patient compliance, surveillance, <laughs> medication initiation, or management while the patient remains outpatient to decrease severe maternal morbidity and avoiding the need for a readmission that disrupts their maternal infant bonding. So current stats, um, I had to cut the data at some point where I had enough data to share, but we've en uh, enrolled 34 patients. We initiated the program in March, uh, March 23rd, and really it took off really the second week in April. We've consented, um, and again, where I've cut the data, uh, 32 out of the 121 patients that we have who've had a hypertension-related disorder, that's 26 of our patients. Um, we had two ER visits. One of the ladies had lower, lower blood pressures, and so she effectively was given some fluids and her medications were adjusted and she went home. And one lady who actually had severe hypertension at home and the nurse wasn't available for that particular moment, we had told her to take, we called her outpatient prescription of nifedipine. She actually took it, got worried because the nurse wasn't there to talk about it, went to the ER and her blood pressures had, had returned to mild and she was discharged as well and remained outpatient. So um, we had zero readmissions. The medications upon discharge, there was about 19% of people who were discharged using medications, but four of those patients actually required up titration of the medications once they were discharged. And the medications that were started outpatient, additional 10 patients, 31% of our patients achieved severe hypertension after discharge and required treatment. The severe hypertension um, development actually on average was day 4.9. And the mean systolic blood pressure was 158 and diastolic was 96, which is actually right on with that study in 1980 that was performed, which is kind of interesting that we're seeing similar. And then the people uh, uh, that are early on finishing, um, they've normalized on day 22 and been able to off titrate medications. So future directions, we, with this data, we will uh, help provide an understanding of the natural time course of postpartum hypertension through six weeks and beyond. And we can compare outcomes in remote patient monitoring versus the standard of care. And then we can also look at analyzing predictors of adverse outcomes and optimal blood pressure treatment for postpartum patients. And what about long-term outcomes uh, for the next pregnancy? Long-term outcomes in life or the next pregnancy? Um, this here is um, a model. And what it, what it highlights is that um, this question that we know of um, people having a hypertension-related disorder in pregnancy do have actually a, a two to three increased goal risk of cardiovascular um, morbidity or mortality in their lifetime. And the thought being that people who have a complicated pregnancy on this red line here, they, and they're representing two pregnancies, you know, do they have something underlying in their endothelium or something, you know, about their cardiovascular risk factor that, you know, pregnancy pushes them over. You see a little bit there, they go back to normal and kind of hide out until later in life when it actually becomes a problem. Um, and then the healthy population who doesn't have this underlying risk factor, perhaps, you know, they have some little bump here, but they don't actually um, develop these long-term risk factors. And we, we still don't know a lot about it. Um, but we do know that um, people who have uh, hypertension-related disorder in pregnancy do have a long-term adverse outcome with their cardiovascular, their health and disease. I had to point out Deb Arendal. She's here in the audience. But she has done some work about... Um, you know, cardiovascular disease, hypertension-related issues in pregnancy in the past. And this is a manuscript um, looking at long-term cardiovascular disease outcomes and preeclampsia, and really the importance of engaging obstetricians and gynecologists in cardiovascular disease prevention. 
And the key points from this manuscript really are that cardiovascular risk factors identified during the reproductive years are strongly related to future risk factors. And that there are sex-specific risk factors that are often identified by the obstetrician and gynecologist that provide early identification of women who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease. But the fact that we have a hybrid system of healthcare for women leads to gaps in care which impact lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease. And there's some research out there that talk about, you know, most women in this life, this period of their life are seeing a gynecologist. And seeing a gynecologist, there's a lot less hypertension identified and therefore treatment or ability to actually provide prevention for these women. So engaging the OBGYN providers in cardiovascular disease prevention may provide a new path to engaging women in primary and secondary um, prevention. And then this is just a, a table from that same manuscript looking at cardiovascular risk factors for women in their reproductive years. And I, I just would encourage everyone to be aware of it and things like smoking, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, which are the traditional risks, and then people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, infertility, or these adverse outcomes like a preterm delivery, hypertension-related issues, gestational diabetes, are people that we probably should be providing more education to. And then physical activity restricted people, adverse diets, obesity, and lactation, really, lactation has been shown to decrease your cardiovascular risk profile in the future, and the more we can do to increase, you know, lactation and breastfeeding would be great. And our department has a current effort with obesity, and maybe this is an, an opportunity to tie that in with, with those efforts. So again, here, opportunities to decrease, you know, long-term cardiovascular risk might be uh, found with breastfeeding uh, promotion, as well as um, I think it'd be great to develop a protocol for long-term surveillance and referrals to cardiology and internal medicine as are appropriate. And there are other um, countries and um, programs out there that we don't just stop at six weeks. We actually, if they're, they're persistent at six weeks, they then are just scheduled to have a follow-up at six months and a year, and they're looking at their blood pressure. Do they, do they return to normal? Do they need treatment? And then getting them the proper care that they might need instead of waiting until they get become pregnant again, and then we're just still deciding if they have chronic hypertension, and then it just goes away when they're not, not pregnant. So in summary, for surveillance, I think we can do better. I think perhaps the remote patient monitoring may be an answer. Um, of course, it's not the only answer. Um, treatment, we should feel good about using antihypertensive medications are safe and effective. Pain medications, NSAIDs are unlikely to routinely cause uh, hypertension exacerbation, and I think more efforts are needed there, especially to avoid excessive opiate use. And then for persistent hypertension, I think we can improve strategies to improve follow-up and cardiovascular screening after six weeks postpartum. There's a lot of people that have helped me since I've been here, and it's it's greatly appreciated, and I enjoy working with everybody, and I just wanted to, to acknowledge everyone. And that's it. Thank you, Kara. That was an excellent presentation with, um, you know, an update on things that we don't know that much about and also kind of letting us everyone know about um, the study that's going on. We're now open for questions. Yes, Emily. So just to repeat the question for the home audience, um, Emily Rosen's wondering about um, magnesium sulfate postpartum use, um, whether there's kind of a limit on how many days postpartum we would give the magnesium, for example, three days versus 15 days. So I have to be cautious in this, the way I answer this because there's, again, not great data or evidence to, to say what we should or shouldn't do. But I think the bottom line is we don't have enough evidence and that what we do have, there's a, a review of case mortality in the UK, and they actually conclude that they reviewed all their hypertensive cases of mortality and nobody had seizures after, like, day three. So I think that... Um, if we had more studies and we designed something appropriately, that probably after day three in the absence of proteinuria, certainly they probably don't need actually magnesium. That probably just treating their blood pressure, which is what causes a lot of the morbidity, is the answer. Um, but I think that's kind of a wave of the future and something that we really need to start understanding. Uh, Dr. Hartenbeck. Oh. 
So there's two questions. The first question is what can this group do to um, help further the research efforts? And the second question is why does lactation decrease cardiovascular risk? So to answer the first question, I think everyone is doing a great job already. I think the, the thing that I ask the most is just anybody with uh, hypertension-related disorder of pregnancy, if you please just ask them if they'd be interested in the remote patient monitoring. We have 30 units. We've actually recruited a lot of people, and we've actually been at excess with our machines. Women like it. They're really not opposed to it, but it has to come from a provider to ask them if they're interested. And then there's a clipboard on the fifth and sixth floor. Just add them, and then the process goes from there. The coordinators stop by. The research nurses are then contacted. They bring the equipment. There's nothing about consent that you have to do, follow-up that you have to do. They document all this in the computer. Um, they send notes to the providers. They contact the clinics. And then I sent out a recent um, uh, instruction sheet on how you find those telehealth um, data because they're putting them in the computer so you can actually follow your patient and all their blood pressures daily. So then when they return at six weeks to see you, you're up to date with what's happened, what medications they've been on and all their blood pressure values, but it's not in the actual, like, epic, typical place. It's like a special place you have to go. So I've sent those instructions, and if you don't have them, I'd be happy to resend them. Um, I also, you know, I talk a lot about just the remote patient monitoring patient thing, but I hope a lot more will come out of this, because there's no data in the world about what people's blood pressures do for six weeks postpartum, and this data is, like, the best we have. So the more, more numbers I get and the more patients we have, I'll actually, in the year, be able to, to hopefully provide some really in, important information. And I actually hope to do some modeling about potentially should we lower that threshold to treat blood pressures, and maybe that's an answer. And then, you know, I don't know where it'll go, but I need you guys to help, and I, I hope you find it interesting, and I, I think it's beneficial for the patients. Regarding the lactation part of things, um, I think it probably has to do something potentially with fats and vessels and healing, and, and I, I don't know the answer, I don't know that anybody does, but when they look at cohorts of women who've breastfed, their risks seem to be m more protected. So I never really hear anybody talk about this, but our patients are increasingly exposed to a vasoactive substance, an oxytocin. And I think the outcome of that would be increased free water retention. And you sort of alluded to the fact that, like, should we be giving more patients furosemide? Right. And what are your thoughts about maybe the link between uh, oxytocin exposure as well as should we be giving Lasix more routinely? I think that's a great question. And um, in my... Uh, Last institution, we used Lasix as kind of a joke, like it was in the water system, because it was really something we did a lot of there. The um, current trials that are out there and the trials that have been done look at literally one dose of like 20 to 40 milligrams oral. I don't think that's enough. So these women, a lot of times, are um, fluid overloaded, and we actually use BNPs too. And I know that most people think that's funny or quackery, but when you do it on everybody, you can very much tell people who have volume overloaded hypertension. Um, and so anybody who has evidence of that, I definitely support the use of Lasix. The, um, it's interesting because the um, systematic review that was done with lactation meds, they actually disqualified Lasix from even participating in that review because it decreases breast milk supply. So that's another study I think that could be done. But um, this man that I used to work with, Tom Easterling, who's dedicated his life to hypertension and pregnancy, I mean, he's the one that used Lasix, he's who I learned it from, and he was like, it does not decrease breast milk supply. Um, there's, an, there's an investigator on campus in pharmacology who I've actually wanted to work with and actually wanted to include lactation as part of what I do, but it's like, I can't do everything, but if someone's interested, um, I would love to collect breast milk specimens and even look at different medications, um, and he has the lab to do the analysis in um, and look at potentially volume over different periods in their pregnancy and how much milk they're making, we could potentially mix that. But um, I do think it really um, helps, but I do think that it is going to require mo more Lasix use than just a one single dose. And what we did in Seattle is we actually discharged most people with five days of Lasix. Deb. Thanks, Deb. Oh, it's broadcast. I just want to uh, thank you for a fabulous presentation. And I want to just kind of highlight uh, your work, uh, which I think reflects a, what a lot of people are doing here, is really bringing together both leadership in the community around uh, uh, in improving the quality of care aligned with clinical guidelines, and then also taking what you know and using it to really drill down to build an evidence base to support that work. So, you know, again, you know, kind of thinking about how we as clinical leaders uh, in the state can impact health outcomes as well as do basic research that will inform 
uh, our future guidelines. So, you know, really nice work. Thank you. And just a little uh, echo a little bit and complete your question. I think there's a lot more collaboration that potentially could happen with collecting specimens and other things on the basic science side of things and actually moving forward with more of a joint collaboration as well. Next question. If there's no more questions, thank you. Thank you.